Thank you, Glenn. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties we had, and thank you, everybody, for uh, hanging in there. We will be sending them out, the slides out, when we're completed here today, and we will get to hear Glenn talk as part of our panelists, which are actually coming up now, our interactive panelist session. First, though, we want to share with you uh, the results of the first word cloud. So I believe Rebecca is going to show us that, and we can uh, use that as part of our discussion going forward. Okay, Absolutely. looks like we have research and accessible access are, uh, are popping up to the top. So let's get on with our interactive panel session uh, and we'll see what we, we want you to keep adding information to this. Uh, go back and whenever you think of three different words or if three words, your words change for you, uh, go back in and we'll be putting the link into the message uh, into the chat so you can update it as we go along. Uh, so, like I said, our next session is our panel, and I'm going to share my screen here. And Michael Dunaway is uh, or is going to be our panel moderator, and he is the executive director for resilience in our digital futures um, initiative at UC. And he is going to take it from here, and uh, this should be really interesting. Go ahead, Michael. Thank you, Jane. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Very good. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you all for joining on a, a Friday afternoon for a really interesting day-to-day, uh, -day, our fifth annual, as uh, Dr. Shima Wang pointed out. Um, I'm Michael Dunaway. I'm the executive director of the Digital Futures Program, and I have the honor of, uh, of being able to, uh, to uh, lead this panel and moderate our discussion over the next, uh, next 45 minutes or so. Um, let me start by simply thanking uh, Dr. Glenn Reichert for giving a really terrific talk on the impact of data on day-to-day -day life and using himself as the example, which I thought was quite a bold, uh, brave move to do. Uh, given the fact that we all recognize that our data is going everywhere and somebody else has it uh, in one fashion or another. So I thought that was a really interesting way to approach the topic, but exemplary of everybody else's lives as well. And I also want to thank Dr. Shima Wang and his staff for the work they have put into putting together this day-to-day -day and the people that are making this day possible and also providing our discussion for this afternoon. Um, so what we are going to do for the next, uh, next 45 minutes to an hour or so is we're going to turn this conversation over to the leadership or the guidance of our, some of our resident experts in this field. And you see, like other universities, but this university is particularly gifted, I think, or blessed to have some really outstanding leaders in the fields of many professional fields, but who are applying data in their day-to-day -day work and are understanding its evolution as they're developing their own work, but also they're seeing it contribute to society and to the profession in general that they participate in. So what we're gonna do is we're going to, uh, to uh, I'm, I'm going to make very brief introductions and then I'm gonna turn this over uh, in turn to uh, Dr. Sam Anand, uh, Dr. Zvi Biner, uh, Biner, uh Dr. Whitney Gaskins, Dr. Prashant Carey, and Dr. Ajala Vagal, who are going to discuss in their own areas how data has shaped their lives and their professions. So we have a couple of guidance questions that we have been working on, and these are guidance questions for you to consider as you're listening to these sessions. Um, so the first one is this, how is ubiquitous data changing your work as a researcher, an educator, and a clinician, and or a clinician, and the contribution of your work to society? So that's a kind of a personal question. The, the, the question for each of us, uh, how are we seeing data affecting the work that we do? This is basically the example that Glenn Riker just established for us. And then the second question is more global in nature, and it's also more outwardly facing. How is ubiquitous data changing society and shaping our sense of community? 
And of course, that's a personal question also because we are members of the community. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how, where that goes. And then the question that is at the bottom, which is the guidance question for you all in, in the audience and relates also to the three words questions that you've been adding to our word cloud. Where should you see focus its efforts in order to prepare our students for life in a data enabled globally connected society? And you all know, because you see this every day, that's where we're trending and you live it and we all live it. So without more of that, uh, with, with, with no further ado here, uh, I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Dr. Sam Anand and ask him to sort of lead us off here by talking about his work and where his efforts have been taking him in the area of data management or data, data analysis relative to his profession. So Sam, over to you. Thank you, Michael. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, helping me join this session here. Uh, my name is Sam Anand. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Cincinnati. And uh, I also uh, am the director of the uh, Siemens uh, uh, Simulation Center. I also head another center, the Center for Global Design and Manufacturing. So I have worked in uh, digital design and manufacturing for about 30 years uh, in all aspects of uh, digital manufacturing. So primarily my work uh, entails uh, how to move data, digital data from product design all the way to manufacturing, uh, smart manufacturing, and ensuring that you make quality products, sustainable quality products uh, with the least expensive cost model. So uh, the recent trends in using digital data uh, and not only modeling of process to make a quality product, uh, but also to predict problems and predicting modeling uh, is the cutting edge of what we do here. And one of the things I work on is in additive manufacturing, but we work in all aspects of uh, digital manufacturing. So uh, the other recent trend that has taken uh, into effect uh, recently is the idea of virtual reality and augmented reality in manufacturing. So the idea is how we can use uh, data that we can acquire on the fly on the factory floor for, uh, for machines and processes and use that uh, using data analytics in the cloud to smartly modify things on the fly to make the first part right. So the idea is to increase quality and to make, make custom make parts. So this is not only with respect to consumer product manufacturing, we can also look at it uh, moving into medical area. Here we are working with neurosurgeons on making a, a custom cranial flap based on CT scan data. And uh, we're also working with other industries like Raytheon and, uh, and Honeywell and so on for making metal additive manufactured parts based on digital data and modeling the digital data for the manufacturing process uh, to make the first part right. So th the cutting edge uh, data that is driving this thing that used to be islands of data between product design, manufacturing, inspection, and downstream process is all integrated in the form of what we call as a digital thread and the digital twin is, uh, is the idea of predictive modeling of whatever happens on the factory floor effectively so that you can make the first part right. So those are the driving forces right now. And that is where the cutting edge area is happening in manufacturing. And that's where I work in. So I'd be happy to participate in the panel discussion later on. Thank you, Michael. And on th uh, Sam, thank you very much for, for that. Uh, okay, so next, uh, Zvi Beer, would you please introduce yourself and provide some perspective of your own? Yeah, thank you. So uh, my name is Zvi Beer. I'm a philosopher here at UC. That means that I don't work directly with data, but I like to think about data. Um, in particular, I like to think about the uh, history of data. We sort of speak as if big data is a thing that exploded onto the scene in the last uh, few decades. Uh, in fact, people have been dealing with data for in centuries, really. Uh, if you think of Lloyd's of London, the insurer, um, they're really the first big data firm um, on earth, right? They had to figure out how to insure people um, before there were good data keeping techniques. So this has been going on for a long time. Um, 
one of the figures I work on most is Isaac Newton, who is the uh, first person who, in fact, kept good data records for experiments. Um, just to give you an example, before him, when you ran an experiment, uh, what you wrote down is what you thought was the best result, uh, what you thought maybe was most representative when things kind of aligned right and worked right. He's the first one to actually keep all the records and then average them. To us, that seems obvious. Of course, you average your results. First guy, so important on many levels. He's the guy I'm, I work on a lot. Um, most recently, I've been uh, thinking about the epistemology of big data, that is, how it could be used in the context of big data science and its uh, ethical and practical implications. Um, I'm sure we're going to talk uh, a bit about those, but uh, as I'm sure anyone who works with big data knows, um, they're, uh, they're all over the place. So uh, I look forward to our discussion. So he, thank you very much. Uh, Whitney, can we uh, hear an introduction from you, please? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Whitney Gaskins. I'm an assistant dean in the College of Engineering and Applied Science. I look at a lot of different elements of research, really how we can better train students to innovate. I currently teach two courses, one called Sticky Innovation and another one, Biodesign, and really looking at how students can use the data that is available at their fingertips to develop technologies that will better interact with the world, what are the eth ethics behind the use of that data and how it's applied into their innovation. And we've had some great success and wonderful conversations uh, with students. Um, I personally don't do research uh, um, about data specifically, but I'm more of the practitioner, the user of, of the information that's available. Whitney, thank you very much. Um, Prashant, I'm going to turn to you and ask you to uh, provide a little background on your work, which is uh, which I know to be very technical in nature. Please. Thank you, Michael, and thank you for inviting me to this panel. It's really fantastic to hear Glenn's talk. Uh, so my name is Prashant Kare. I'm an assistant professor in aerospace engineering here at UC. Uh, I also am the chair of the Advanced Research Computing Center, which is the new High Performance Computing Center at UC. So in my research, what I really do is look at fundamental processes uh, which take place in a combustion system. So think of a car, a semi-truck or aircraft or a spacecraft, whatever have you, that interests me. Uh, and I do all of these uh, investigations using high-performance computing. So that's sort of my connection with, uh, with data. And so while uh, I'm very new to data science, as people uh, uh, are talking about it, I am a prolific generator of data. So we, we as in, in my research group, we generate terabytes and terabytes of data every week. And the key is how do we actually look at the data to come up with uh, findings? So that's sort of uh, one of the things which I'm uh, doing right now. I'm using some of the newly uh, developed uh, techniques in machine learning and AI to actually look at uh, sciences. For example, things which, are, which have some basic laws of nature, right? Uh, specifically to fluids and combustion sciences. So that's sort of in a nutshell what I do. So in terms of the applications, uh, we study uh, diesel engines, uh, we study aircrafts, uh, we study high-speed propulsion systems such as scramjets and rotating detonation engines and so on and so forth, uh, really trying to understand the, what happens really inside these systems in, in a quest to actually improve them as people build them. Uh, so I'll turn it back to Michael and uh, I'll be very, Happy to discuss more uh, as we move on. Great, thank you, Prashant. And finally, Achala, please uh, please join the group and uh, and introduce yourself for us. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Achala Bagal. I am a, a physician uh, from the College of Medicine. I'm a neuroradiologist. Um, one of the things that I I'm you know I, I was as I was chatting to some of the other folks over here earlier. My area of interest is stroke um, and intracranial hemorrhage. So if people don't know what neuroradiology means, um, it basically is all the brain 
and spine and head and neck, but I'm a radiologist. So pretty much every imaging, every X-ray, every CT scan, every MRI, that's what we do. We interpret it. And so we are one of the biggest generators of data, if you may. Um, in fact, in 2015, there were close to 60 billion imaging that was generated only in the US. And now if you add to it the electronic health records, the genetic data, you're talking about health data, which is up to like 2,500 exabytes in 2020. So this is a ridiculous amount of data that we um, work with in, in, in our everyday lives. And um, I want to address something that um, Michael had asked earlier, how is the ubiquitous data affecting us? And how is it affecting me as my role as a clinician, as a researcher? Um, one of the big things is obviously the data explosion. But one of the really, really cool things is that how AI is changing the medicine. And when I say that, I mean basically not only just diagnostics, but about how do you triage a patient? How do you do risk stratification? So my area in stroke, I'll give you a specific example. In this past few years, now there are AI tools which basically are on our phone, which tell us in a stroke patient if there is a vessel occlusion. So it basically means there is a vessel clot and we can see how much of the brain is dead and how much of the brain is salvageable. All these decisions, these images are basically transmitted on a phone and the stroke team makes this decisions in minutes. So we are texting, deciding what to do with this patient. So time is brain and the AI tools are giving us that ability to actually really change patient lives and patient transport, patient treatment. So that I think is the biggest um, exciting part of the medicine and radiology for data. And I will also just finally say that the biggest um, other big hot debate in our field um, generated by some of the tech giants who have said that uh, big data and AI is going to replace radiologists. And I want to give a very strong opinion saying that no, we will not be replaced. I think artificial intelligence is augmented intelligence. It will augment and help the physicians but will not replace radiologists. And that's the biggest debate topic. And if you thought yesterday's debate was big, I can tell you this is a bigger debate topic. But I would love to um, uh, take part in more of these discussions, um, especially regarding this question that even um, Glenn alluded to, that what are the ethics of all this data when you get it? And really how smart can we be when we want to use the data as a user and a producer? So looking forward to it. Achala, thank you very much. You've, uh, you've sort of set the stage for the follow-on question that I want to ask the entire group, uh, the panel as a whole, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm going to ask you to reflect on this in your area and then, then maybe sort of open, the, open it up to uh, cross conversation between our group here. Um, so Glenn gave us a really good overview of kind of the evolution of data and how we got here. Um, and what it has meant in our individual lives, and he, as I alluded to, he used himself as a, as a, as a noteworthy example there on a day-to-day -day basis. I want you to speculate in your area of expertise, where now do you anticipate the future is going to, and I mean, the, let's talk about the immediate future in the five to 10 year range, which I realize in data and computers and in information technology is actually quite a long time. <clears throat> But where do you think that you are going to see the biggest change in your professional areas in the near term as a result of the expansion of data uh, analytic capability and access both by the profession and by the end users, which may be the public, but it also may be our own technicians and our own uh, research scientists in that. Prashant, I'm gonna turn to you and ask if you would provide a little perspective on that yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Michael, for the question. So I think I'm going to piggyback on uh, something which Glenn said almost at the end of his uh, talk, which was about the genesis. So people start doing experiments and then start building mathematical models. And then computing came in, so where you're solving those mathematical models, and now the fourth paradigm, which is data science. So I'm going to sort of relate to uh, what I do exactly in these terms. So uh, 
uh, let me first preface this, that uh, experiments are never going to be replaced. Let's start from there. Uh, that being said, so why do we want to use something else other than experiments? So, so for one, experiments are very expensive. Uh, the other point is that it's very difficult to take measurements in space and time everywhere to actually get the full picture of what is happening, uh, for example, in my research inside an engine, right? Uh, so that's why we want to do uh, computations, which is basically solving these mathematical models which are governing a physical process, right? Now let's come down to uh, uh, inside modeling. We have different kinds of ways of modeling things. So some are, we can basically categorize them into say high fidelity modeling and lower fidelity modeling. Basically saying that one is providing more details, the other one is not, right? Now, when you come to design, for example, say designing an aircraft, the aircraft is very big, right? So it's very difficult to do a high fidelity design, not because it's hard to solve the equations or the models, but it's very expensive. Less expensive than an experiment, but still very expensive for an industry to do that for design purposes. So more often than not, uh, what they do is they use these higher resolution uh, calculations very sparingly for very critical items. And for most things, they use lower fidelity where you don't get the full picture, you get an average picture of things looking at what is happening. So this is sort of the context of how I'm trying to get into data. So now with the advent of this fourth paradigm of science, which is data science, now we can maybe inform these lower fidelity models from the higher ones right so more refined studies to lower refined studies and this bridge is getting uh, connected by data right so in my area there's a new concept called physics informed machine learning right and basically what we are doing is we are taking these experiments and we are taking this very high resolution studies and making models and putting them into lower fidelity ones so the cost is low but the accuracy is high right so this is how Data is coming in into my life and my research. Um, so this is all about software. I'm just being talking about software now, right? But what I'm really excited about, other than these new advances in software, is actually hardware technologies. So we have already seen in the last uh, couple of decades the advent of GPUs and how it's, uh, it has accelerated everything around. But in the next 10 to maybe 20 years, I think uh, quantum computing is going to change everything. It's going to be very challenging because people like me and uh, folks here and probably all the listeners here will have to deal with this challenge of how to actually use this. It will be completely different uh, as opposed to what we do it now and how to write new algorithms to actually use this. And so I think I'm very excited on that front as well in hardware. So uh, just uh, two, two sides of this thing. Sean, thank you very much for that. Um, let me turn the, the, the question over to, to Whitney a little bit. And Whitney, let me ask you, particularly, if you would reflect on the, the students you work with and the changes you are seeing in the educational process, and also a little bit about what you see as their perspectives on the world that they are in and the world that they're going into when they graduate and leave and uh, and go on to their own professions, they're sort of on the cutting edge of the changes because they're going to be seeing them and living them. Um, what, what, can you, uh, what can you say about what you have, have witnessed with, your, with the groups that you work with? Yeah, so thank you for the question. I think that what we're seeing now is a shift to in a lot of professions. So a lot of students say, I'm not really comfortable with data. I'm a marketing major. I thought I could just use my creative mind to do this job. And what I think what we're experiencing now is a shift in society that every career is going to have to get comfortable with the data that is collected. I mean, marketing is no longer creative slogans and jingles. That might be a part of it, but there's geotagging now and understanding how to better market your product use with the use of this everyday data, all of those browser searches, all of that information, how our students aren't necessarily comfortable with the use. But on the flip side, they're comfortable being the producers of the data. They're completely aware that they're plugged into the system and in pro in producing this data, but they aren't necessarily 
comfortable with being the one to analyze or use the data in their profession. This is going to be a huge shift in culture, not just in higher education, but when we talk about K through 12 education as well. The trepidation is understandable because we are as a society a little enumerate. So different from being literate, we don't have the same comfort with numbers as we do with our literacy. And so we really have to have a push for all understanding numbers. We need a more numerate society as we are collecting this information and working through science literacy so they understand what it actually means. We see now that people are not that comfortable in, in it, it's systematic like or systemic. We, we see this all the way through. I know some educators that are like, I might only spend 15 minutes on math but an hour on reading, right? And so that starts as young as first grade. So if we can't get everyone comfortable with understanding what is being collected and how they can use it, even in careers that were traditionally considered creative, we aren't going to have a great push when they get to higher education to deal with this information. So I think that as a society, we need to turn to a more numerous society so we can actually use this data that we're collecting. Terrific. Thank you for those thoughts. And uh, while I'm turning to some of our other speakers, I want you to give some thoughts to how you would solve that problem from your, you know, how would you get a grip on that from your perspective? We'll come back to that here in a little bit. I'm going to, I'm going to point that question at you. Um, Achala, you kind of started this by talking about the, uh, the perspective that you had from the medical profession uh, could I circle back to you and ask you if you would reflect on where you see the medical community headed in the future relative to, uh, to the proliferation of data in your own, uh, in, in the profession of, of medicine in general, but also in the, in the profession or the relationship between medicine and the profession and the public that you serve? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And it's a million dollar question. Um, I, I won't have answers. I'm going to put out more, you know, food for thought, because this is something, you know, what Whitney was mentioning that our, the, the younger generation and the college, you know, students need to get comfortable with data. Well, guess what? The physicians are getting comfortable with data and we, we are almost forced to get comfortable. So I feel we always joke about this, that the, that the physicians who will be obsolete are not, not because of the artificial intelligence, but who will not adapt to it. So I think that's the biggest lessons that the medical professional is learning that we have to adapt. We have to be okay with all this data and to figure out the best practices. I think um, the big data and the, the AI analytics tools is creating a lot of um, questions that we didn't even know how to address. Like number one of the questions I would say, again, writing from you know, Glenn's talk, who is the owner of the data? So all this data that we are generating, I was very surprised to see that car slide and people wondering who owns the car slide. But I mean, if you think about the patient's data that we are collecting, right, brought from EHR, imaging and genetics, is it the patient? Is it the hospital? Is it the physician? Is it the AI tool maker? Who, who is responsible? Who owns that data? And I think those are the questions where we have to be honest and transparent. So the other from the transparency, I would say one big thing is when we start using these data-driven AI tools to make a diagnosis, to make a judgment call, we need to know what the algorithm tells us, how true it is. We saw those inferences of Glenn's right through the airport. Well, what if this happens for a real patient, right? So that's where the public trust comes in, is that being transparent about saying, what the AI tool or the data can or cannot do, what are the pitfalls? Maybe it's not a big black box that we don't understand because in the end for a physician, it's a physician, patient, public trust. And I think trust comes through transparency. So I would say my biggest takeaway for everybody on this panel and the listeners, because you were, guys are all super smart and going to be creating a lot of data related AI tools is that you really have to be transparent about what is happening, but also have open conversation with all stakeholders, which includes the public, because that's the only way we can get trust. 
I'm glad you raised that word of trust. And we're going to circle back to that here at, 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 at a little bit later on as well, because I think that's basically fundamental to a lot. But in the medical profession, you see that personally every time you meet a patient. So uh, it's, it's, it's a very important concept. But it gets to the not only the trustworthiness of the data, but the trustworthiness of the interpretation of the data as well. So thank you for that observation. Zvi, I want to I want to return to you and get your perspective as the uh, as our historian in the uh, in the, 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 the history of science, but also the history of ep ep uh, epistemology. Where do you see our use of data and um, the the incorporation of the flood of data in our everyday lives and society? Where do you think that's taking us? What do you see into the future? Um, well, as a way of answering that question, let me let me first answer your first question, which is where do I see things, you know, in 10 years? Um, I think one of the main shifts we're going to see is that decisions that pertain to our everyday lives will be more transparently made by non-human actors. Um, they're already made that way to a large degree, but right now we... we almost always have a human interface between us and the algorithm deciding. So Achala's example is perfect, right? She, she stands in between the, the phone that's uh, giving her information and the patient. Um, that barrier, I think, will get eroded more and more, perhaps never in some cases like radiology, but more and more in other cases. And people will have to be comfortable with with dealing with that, right? So if you think going through a phone tree is annoying uh, when the computer talks to you, just imagine if the decision itself at the end of the phone tree is, is, is just by, made by a computer, perhaps with no underlying logic that's diagnosable, right? So as, as we all know, um, there are certain AI algorithms that we understand the underlying logic of, but there are many where we don't. We know how to build them, um, but but that's about it, right? Um, and so when, for example, your insurance coverage is being decided by one of those and you try to get someone to explain to you, well, why is it that I'm not covered? And they say, well, actually no one knows. Uh, we just know that when we feed the right inputs to this thing, we get the right outputs and we've optimized our, you know, our profit curve, right? Um, that's gonna be the challenge, right? Where all of us on a really on a day-to-day -day basis are gonna have to deal with decisions that are not made by humans. Um, which is a way to get into your second question. Um, I think, right, we, in discussion of data, uh, let me just make a, a rough and ready distinction, right? We have to distinguish between accumulation of information, which undoubtedly, uh, as uh, uh, as Glenn's presentation showed, we are uh, accumulating in, in, in an exponential way. There's the accumulation of knowledge, which is different than just mere accumulation of information. Um, it's something over and beyond mere information. It's how we understand the world, um, some kind of insight into the way things work. Over and beyond that, um, there's what we might call just a wise use of information or, or wisdom, right? Which I don't even want to try to define. We all know that it's different from knowledge somehow, um, and it's deeper and in some sense more important, but let's just leave it at that. Um, I think the big challenge is how to make sure that the accumulation of information, in fact, leads to good knowledge, um, because data doesn't make decisions. Data doesn't tell us what the world is like. It's what we, people do all those things, right? People are ultimately the one who design uh, the criteria which allow machines to make decisions. They're all ultimately the ones who interpret the, the deliverances of the data. If they don't know how to do that, then the data is fairly meaningless. Um, just to tie it back to, uh, uh, Whitney's educational point, uh, not only do students not know how to deal with data itself, that's one skill. Another skill is just to interpret data once you have it. Make sure that you're aware of all the assumptions that go into both the collection of data and then the use of the data. You're aware of the implications of how that data is put to use kind of like later down, 
down the line, right? The consequences. And if those kick in to action, unintended consequences that, you know, are pretty foreseeable, but they're not the ones you really care about. Um, or if it's just kind of vanilla and it's going to be okay. Um, I think those kinds of, um, um, I don't want to call them a decision tree, but uh, those set of skills are going to be both the ones that we as a society are going to have to learn and are going to have to learn to deal with not seeing, right? We're going to have to learn to deal with decision being made for us where we don't have access to any of that information. Thank you very much. The idea of, of uh, machines making decisions on our behalf that we may not know where they came, where the decision came from, and how much of it was affected by us and by external factors is a that's an interesting and challenging concept to deal with. I think you're uh, you're on the mark about what that problem is going to or what that challenge is going to raise in terms of, of our relationships to uh, to data and to each other. Uh, Glenn, if I could ask you, based on what you've heard, and also more specifically, I know from your work with US Ignite that you have worked with some of the cities in the country that are at the cutting edge of applying these kinds of technologies to very real problems in their own spaces and in their own regions, and then assessing the outcomes and determining how things have been going. And I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on what you have seen over the last you know, couple of years in terms of general trends, but also where do you think we're headed? Uh, and, and what are the challenges that cities are now seeing in terms of the way they want to apply these kinds of data acquisition and processing technologies in their work? Great question, thank you very much. Uh, so there are some very uh, exciting success stories. So for example, in San Diego, They've equipped vehicles that travel anyway throughout the city, such as um, the, the people who monitor parking and uh, police vehicles, with cameras that are looking down. No privacy concern. You're just looking at the pavement. There shouldn't be anyone lying on the pavement in front of the vehicle. So that uh, camera goes and records all of the pavement that it sees, and then machine learning is used to de decide which of the cracks that it sees need to be filled because they're likely to become potholes. And that has saved the Department of Transportation tens of thousands of dollars per year because they fix it when it's cheap to fix, when it's small, and they only fix the ones that uh, need to be fixed. So pretty good success story for using data there. Uh, uh, let's see, another one that uh, I could go and pick out is um, in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. They did a citizen science project to put up air quality sensors throughout the uh, basin subject to uh, inversions in the winter. And it turns out that the small number of EPA certified sensors gives you a reading not for the area, but for the place the sensor is. And by placing sensors around the, the area, you're detecting up to 10 to one changes in pollution, even within the same metropolitan area, depending on the microclimates that are created by the mountains surrounding Salt Lake City. And we've since discovered that those kinds of microclimates are also present in Cleveland, in Chattanooga, and in Kansas City. And they are now also implementing um, these uh, air sensors to be able to understand and find undocumented sources and unpermitted sources in their area. And it's really important right now in COVID-19 because we have early data from Bergamo, Italy, that says that COVID-19 viruses like the hitch on uh, particles of air pollution which get blown around and therefore can travel much further than just landing on the ground if there's no air pollution. So those are some of the kinds of things that have been uh, very successful so far. Uh, you asked what are some of the challenges in going forward. I would say it's this entire area we've been talking about of how reliable is this data, who owns it, who owns the economic value of it, uh, how is it kept, is it used for science, is it reproducible? Is it uh, something that is replicable? Those are different concepts. The National Academy came out with a recent report on, on that saying it's really very important in science to be able to be both replicable and reproducible for the science experiments that we're doing. And those issues have never been faced before by municipalities. This kind of uh, understanding of we have data here that has multiple uses. We either just put it out for public like uh, Palo Alto did, 
they said all the data we collect as a municipality we are going to just make publicly available we just made them one of the most scraped sources for data in the country to people who say we're going to provide privacy for our citizens by not letting any of the data out which was obviously also the opposite of the curve and not very valuable so lots going on there michael glenn thank you very much that's uh really um sort of a ground level view from across the nation. So uh, so thanks for that. Um, so I'm gonna, just a, a small um, administrative comment here. I've been asked to, uh, to speak a little louder, so I'm going to more or less shout into my microphone. This is a brand new setup for me. And if I start changing buttons, I have no idea what's gonna happen. So uh, <laughs> one, one of the comments I wrote down from, uh, from Glenn's remarks was that, uh, uh, there is lots of stuff that just goes wrong. So uh, I'm not going to try to put myself in that position. Um, what I want to do for the next 15 minutes or so of our, of our time on this conversation is I want to make a little bit of a change uh, over to our second question. And that was uh, the second question that we had with our framing question is how is ubiquitous data changing society and shaping our sense of community? And um, so, uh, Jane, let me interject just long enough to ask, can you hear me okay now? Yes, we can hear you much better. Thank you, okay, Michael. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, I've worked with Glenn for a number of years in the smart city uh, and smart communities movement. Um, and I just wanted to provide a little bit of a reflection on something that I have seen uh, in my own, my own field. My own field is in basically disaster resilience, community resilience, and emergency management but I've been involved in smart cities and there has been a very interesting evolution that I think Glenn has probably observed as well, or you can cor correct my perception, Glenn. Um, when we first started in smart cities, it was all about how to bring in a technology to solve a problem. And there was a lot of interface and discussion about how we get the private sector involved in developing new technologies and what gets marketed and what can cities afford to buy and whether they can afford to buy it at scale. So it was really focused on technology issues. About four years ago, that conversation began to change dramatically. And it began to be, it's not about the technology, it's about the data that the technology is giving us. Because the data is what the base is what is what decisions are based on. They're not based on the technology, they're actually based on the data. And this goes to the mayor's office or it goes to public works or it goes to emergency management. But the conversation really started to, to shift significantly about the data. And that led to data quality and data validity. And also then from there to the decisions that are being made using the data. So now we're into decision quality and decision veracity and validity. And that leads to yet another question, which is if we can trust our technologies in terms of reliability, in terms of their uh, ability to be dependable, um, or at least predictable in terms of mean time between failures and those kind of concepts having to do with both technology systems, and we can trust the data because we have, verif we have the ability to validate it and to verify its auth authenticity, how can we trust the decisions that get made using that data? So now we're bleeding into the ethical dimension. And this is, the, in, this, in the smart cities groups that I have been working with, that I've worked with, the most interesting shift in our conversation has now gone into the circle of ethical decision-making, of how we manage data and gate access to it about transparency and public relationships. So now we're into something much less tangible, but much more significant about the issue that Achala raised having to do with tr trust. And trust and how much we trust our technologies. How, do we, how much do we trust our data? How much do we trust the decisions that get made out of that data? And then how do we trust the decision makers who are using that data to make those decisions? So it's been an interesting evolution, uh, but I want to circle back to that very question and talk a little bit about the trust issue. Um, so let me go back to this again. How is ubiquitous data changing society and our sense of community? And Whitney, I guess I would start with you, if you don't mind, based on your relationships with the educational community and with your students. 
Can you reflect a little bit on that? I, I was thinking about the sense of community that might be built from having an extreme amount of data. And I can tell you that it has reformed the way people teach. So when I think about teachers in general, because they have a different form of um, communication and information that they can share with their students and in their classrooms. So what we do see um, from having so much data is that learning environments are changing and the experiences in learning environments are also changing because of the prevalence of data that is available. And it can also contextualize data for the learner. So one thing that we find out um, is that sometimes students don't feel connected to the work and that's why they don't like the information that they're learning. But this having this um, large data set or the availability of information can help educators contextualize the information to a student. And so then they are learning maybe some skill sets. And I think that we were talking previously about the skills that are needed with data. It's not just being comfortable with the data, but it's also interpreting that data. It helps contextualize that for learners. So that helps in, in that sense when I talk about or think about community building. Um, but I was trying to think in a larger sense, does it actually make people feel more connected to each other? I don't necessarily see that in the classroom, but I can see people are more connected to different information that interests them. Thank you very much for that. Let me turn, Sam, I, I wanna turn back to you relative to the technology dimension of this and particularly things like system reliability and engineering reliability and sort of its relationship to our trust in systems in general. Could you talk a little bit about what you've seen in your profession and in the areas of, of, of manufacturing and development and, uh, and tools that get made for the use by public, but also use by professionals in, 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 uh, in engineering fields, for instance? Michael, thank you. So I, I think, you know, let me step back. Uh, in terms of data itself, you know, what I work with is data product design and factory data. Uh, there's a revolution going on. Uh, first, additive manufacturing. Uh, it's, it's a big deal right now. You can make, uh, immediately model and make designs of parts that were never possible five years ago. They are lightweight designs uh, and uh, can reduce weight of parts by 50%. Imagine that in the auto industry and the aircraft industry, how much of fuel saving that's going to yeah. result in. And also multi-material, you can combine two or three materials in one manufacturing process to give it unique properties that cater to different things here. And uh, like embedding electronics in, 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 a, in a part right during the build process. So that's on printed electronics and, and that's taking it to a new realm. Uh, that's an additive manufacturing. Of course, you know, the lightweight uh, parts and, uh, and, and the unique pro properties of those uh, materials uh, is very, very much in, in use in the medical field too. So for example, making implants and long bone implants and other kinds of cranial implants, uh, there's a lot of work in trying to design and tailor and custom make parts using additive manufacturing right from MRI and CT scan data. And that is a given right now, and that is unique. You can, you can, you can do those things with additive manufacturing. And that, that, is a, uh, that is something that's come about in the past two years. The second part is using data on the factory floor, using newer devices like mixed reality and virtual reality, where each uh, you know, factory floor machine uh, has uh, you know, sensors, 20 or 30 sensors, and you have 300, 400 machines on the factory floor. The idea is to collect real-time data either using an iPad or if it's virtual reality, you're sitting 200 miles away and you see all the data coming out of each of these machines that you can pull up to the cloud, do data analytics, and then do immediate feedback and process correction to make a first part right. So you don't have to inspect parts anymore. You actually have, you can make parts the first time right and economically. And this, modeling, predictive modeling, because of the data that we have, you can model the process and figure out what's going to happen in the process before you build the part. So that's huge right now because now you can fix it before you can start making the part here. And the third thing is the, you know, the industry 5.0, 4.0. So people talked about human being a little, uh, Chala talked about it. Uh, so the idea is basically, you know, if you, uh, if you take uh, an example of industry 4.0, so there's robots, additive manufacturing sensors, 
uh, cybersecurity is a big deal right now. If people talked about data in the manufacturing, you know, cybersecurity, which I'll just talk about in a minute. How to combine all these things with human in the loop? Because everybody has figured out that everything is not automation. It's not going to work perfectly well. Exactly what she said. You got to have human in the loop here. Industry 4.0 has automated everything. Okay, that's the fourth industrial revolution. Now they figured this humans have to be in the loop in decision making and the data flow. And that gives you the best outcome. And that is, that is, that is what everybody is striving towards right now in terms of being human in the loop here. And fourthly, in terms of data security, cybersecurity of digital data, product data, manufacturing data is huge with all the things going on. Um, you know, people want to protect data. Uh, if you imagine a company like GE or Raytheon or Honeywell, uh, they have factories all around the world and each factory has multiple machines and products. And you're collecting sensor data 24 seven all the time. And all the data is stored and you need to protect it. Yeah, of course you need to analyze it, but you need to also protect it. And that is, that, is, that is key right now. And cybersecurity and manufacturing is a very, very big deal right now in protecting the data here. So th that's what I see happening. In the next few years, yes, there'll be digital data used from a part data product model all the way to fixing things on the factory floor instantaneously to make the first part right and storing volumes of data coming out using a virtual reality model that you can pick up and store on the cloud and do immediate analytics that you fix a problem and also you know take the data the digital thread from design to manufacturing to the consumer how they use the product what happened there and how the data can feed back to next legacy next uh, iteration of your design that is all important and one other thing is still we're talking about all these new trends here a lot of factories and you know shop floors around the world have older machines and they don't have sensors so we need to come up with methods to extract the data here we just finished a project with dmdii where we put very very inexpensive logitech cameras to record information from machines and then interpret them on the fly using computer vision and image processing so that you know somebody far away can look at what's happening so the idea is to have a balance between combining legacy data machines of machines that are older machines and then newer machines and combining that data here. So yeah, and I, I, I agree, you know, when, when Achala talked about interpreting data on radiographic images using image processing and machine learning, it's a big deal, but it's not gonna happen. Everything is not gonna happen without some part of a human being in the loop here. Thank you. Sam, thank you very much. That's uh, it's interesting how on the machine floor and the factory uh, factory processes, you've circled all the way back around the human in the loop and even ethics in terms of uh, of manufacturing and relationships to customers and outcomes. That's that, yep. that's terrific. Really appreciate that. Thank you, um, Prashant. I want to uh, I, I want to throw a question in your direction. You and I have talked a lot about high performance computing. Uh, and certainly you're a specialist in it and I am certainly not, but uh, I'd like you to reflect on where you see high performance computing going relative to the its a potential impact on our everyday lives and how uh, citizens in, in, in their normal lives are likely to see the impact of, of very high intensity uh, real-time computing capacity. Thanks for the question, Michael. So a uh, couple of things on that. So high performance computing, uh, indirectly affects all of us and basically everything that you use. And being in, in aerospace, I'm gonna give an example of an aircraft. So um, as uh, Sam said, with uh, additive manufacturing and things like that, you're building things lighter and which basically means you can fly faster and longer and more safe and so on and so forth. And high performance computing is playing a big role in all of these things, right? Uh, so so that's just an application of what we maybe don't think about computing coming in, but it actually is a very critical part of uh, the design infrastructure now in, in computing. So, so, so that's one part of where I'm coming from. The other part where decisions are going to be made using computing, high performance computing is uh, something which uh, Glenn said about auto autonomous vehicles, right? So these vehicles have to make decisions on the fly uh, to make sure that they are taking the right course of action on the road, not hitting somebody, 
And uh, to do that, uh, probably GPUs are going to be installed on these cars, which are basically taking data from all around it, all kinds of data, uh, camera data, other sensors which are on these cars, and processing it to make the next decision. Now, the ethics of it will come out to be, if there's a collision course which is imminent, who dies? So that's a classic question which people in this area think about of what is the algorithm going to do when uh, there's a collision course which is inevitable, what happens now? Uh, I also want to touch upon a little bit about what uh, all the panelists were talking about. It's, so in my view, it's performance versus trust versus explainability. So I think the AI and ML algorithms can perform way outperform humans, right? Now it comes down to the trust and explainability. So for things which I do, which are uh, computing based on physical laws of nature, uh, it's sort of a little easier to look at explainability because somebody who is an expert in, say, for example, fluid mechanics can look at what the machine is interpreting and say, you know, this is wrong or right because it's laws of nature. Now, things like decision making, for example, what Zui was talking about in terms of, say, uh, insurance. Now, here it's not a law of nature of how do you optimize things, and it's up to the human who's designing a system for optimizing profit. So now this is where the, for in my mind, this is where the ethics comes in. Who decides what things are optimized for? So I'm going to sort of leave this question here for uh, other experts to think about and uh, stop here. Thank you for sound. You sort of queued up where I wanted to head next anyway. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to ask one more question from our panelists and then Jane, I'm going to ask you uh, after we do one more uh, Q and A here, a question here. If we have questions from the audience that we can turn to the panel, uh, let me let me turn to to, to Zvi. I, I had a specific question I I wanted to ask him. So Zvi, you, it's not often we have access to a professional philosopher. So uh, I wanted to ask you the question. You've alluded to the fact that what we do in the data world has certainly added to the sum total of human digits, ones and zeros. It is also added to the sum total of human knowledge, and we all recognize that. I want to ask you if you could reflect a little bit on whether you think there is any contribution to human wisdom or a direction in the, in the future where our use of data systems and our use of data in everyday lives will actually improve us as individuals and potentially us as societies in general. So I, I wonder if you could reflect on the wisdom question for us. Sure. Um, I have to confess that in this regard, I'm uh, both a skeptic and a bit of a traditionalist um, in, in the following sense. Um, I think to the extent that people have been using their tools wisely, since people have been using tools, um, they will continue to do so. And to the extent that they haven't, they will continue not to do so. Um, each new technology uh, uh, provides us with both the challenges and the opportunities to face these questions over and over again. Are we using this properly? Are we using this fairly? Are we using this justly? Um, those decisions just have to be made over and over and over again. The idea that we could make them once and then move on, it just it doesn't work that way. The, the world doesn't work that way. Um, and so what, what the, uh, the accelerated pace of this technology um, suggests is that, in fact, these are going to be harder for us to manage. Um, between the time we had to figure out how to use a hammer and how to use a wheel, a lot of years passed by. Um, that is now, you know, in the order of months um, when a new algorithm is put into place that might rely on some different sensors, different data, and we have to figure out, hey, are those sensors collecting the data that matters for us? Are they leaving out data that might change the outcome of this decision? Um, so to answer your question, I'm very skeptical that uh, big data technology is tied to wisdom in any appreciable way, other than the fact that it, uh, it provides us with challenges uh, to exercise whatever little wisdom we have um, in implementing our tools. 
Thank you, Zvi. That's a topic we could carry on with for a long time, but uh, we don't have that time. So, uh, can I make a quick comment? <laughs> <laughs> Prashant, please go right ahead. So, so actually, I'm going to give a reverse example of where our wisdom is increasing. So, because of all this data, which is now shareable between scientists, I think discoveries are uh, are really accelerating. So, maybe the collective knowledge of humans might be increasing uh, because of this ubiquity of data. But on the other side, being looking on the pessimist side, I feel that maybe because people are thinking of just crunching numbers coming out from a black box, and to the point of all the people on this panel talking about interpretability, I think that's maybe we are becoming less wise because we are just taking the word of a machine and not really thinking about why or what. Can I just add one thing? I know we're running out of time, but. One yeah, of the actually, things it, that it appears it, we're not running out of time until, yeah, until okay, 340, so we're good. Go right ahead. <laughs> I think one of the most fascinating things about in thinking about data is the idea that we certainly get from all introductory science books uh, and certainly um, introductory data science books that the data itself is, is just a neutral mirror of the world. All we're doing is just writing down what's already there. Um, if you just start there, you could also stop there, right? That is patently false. Um, it's false in the very simple sense that we can't collect all data about everything, if that's even a coherent concept. And, and lots of people argue that that's not even a coherent concept. We make theoretical choices about what data to collect to what ends and for the purpose of optimizing what function, be it make things fast, um, cheap, uh, light, et cetera. Um, we have to make these decisions before we get data. Um, and so even the very idea that what we're just doing is just sweeping a net of things and then figuring out what to do with them, um, we need to stop before that, right? The data itself embodies decisions that have been made by the previous generations of data collectors and um, device manufacturers. Um, and so as much as there is a looking forward process and thinking about data, there's a looking backwards process and saying, well, what led us to this point and to value these data as opposed to those other data? And should we be looking at something else that just hasn't occurred to us yet? That's a great point. I just noticed that one of the, one of the comments coming in from the audience having to do with bias and the way we collectively interpret the data we get or preferentially interpret the data we get if we're not careful about, about paying attention to biases and learning how to weed them out or learning how to manage them. That's a very good point. Let me open that, oh, on that note, let me simply open the floor up to our panelists since we have maybe 10, we've got about 10 to 15 more minutes here. Um, are there observations based on our conversations and based on the sharing of our of our information and perspectives that, that you would want to share with us right now. So I'll just open that up. I just wanted to add to the uh, confirmation bias uh, notion. Confirmation bias has a lot to do with how we tend to look at our data. And sometimes we even collect our data with, a, with respect to wanting to prove a confirmation bias without trying to be as uh, impartial as we need to be as true scientists in being able to do that. Yeah, and I think I want to add to that, I think Rebecca's question and Glenn's point about bias in the, even in the medical field, we are very careful about whether the AI algorithm, you know, what kind of data was used to create that algorithm, it might not translate into another, you know, non-similar gender or race. Um, and so, um, you know, to Rebecca's uh, second part of her question is that um, we have a lot of now almost like guidelines that actually have to be met before you can publish a paper on AI. And one of them is how was the data collected? What was, was it generalizable? Was it heterogeneous enough? So you cannot collect, you know, uh, or make an AI tool on say Caucasian males and then expect the same risk stratification for African-American females. It's a whole different, um, you know, disease process, different risk factors. So I think at least in the medical field, we recognize this. And so this is almost like being asked by the editors and the reviewers of these papers. Um, so that's one of the you know, small steps that we are taking 
towards making it more um, or less biased, but more homogeneous and had removed that heterogeneity. I would like to discuss a piece that Sam talked about and then also piggybacking off of what was just said. That human part of, of data and algorithm building cannot be ignored. Um, before I joined the academy, I worked at Toyota for about five years. And part of the entire manufacturing process was about making sure that as the engineer, we understood the data that was coming from what, whatever sources we were collecting it from. And that part was intentional. Like they will, the company itself believes very heavily about the human interaction because the fact that data is biased. And I wanna talk about how it gets there sometimes because we as people are the ones building those algorithms. And so if I'm building the algorithm, all of my bias is gonna be part of what I build, regardless if I'm trying my best to remove it, you can't remove who you are as a person. And so I feel like some people forget about that piece when they're talking about data. And it, it lends itself to the bigger conversation of, well, who is building the algorithm? And when we find out who, we see that there's a lack of diversity in who is building, largely it, it is the same demographic. I, you don't hear about women, people of color in these fields that are working on data and the algorithms to analyze the, the data or produce the data. And that's a problem because we can see that um, in some situations when we try to use artificial intelligence, marginalized populations continue to be marginalized. I think about how they use video cameras at traffic stops and in the research afterwards, uh, how um, accurate it was. Undoubtedly, it was, it was profiling people of color over and over again. They were saying it was person X when it was actually person Z, but that's because whoever was coding the algorithm and the biometrics doesn't have an understanding of everybody. I just wanna put that out there that that's a huge problem especially when we're talking about diversity and users of this information. You have to have a critical lens of who produced the information and how they set it up uh, because it actually has ethical consequences. And the training sets that get used need to be very inclusive. That's been probably the number one error that's been made is not having an inclusive enough training data set because if you don't train these, uh, uh, these uh, deep neural networks with a representative or a data set or a data set that's going to uh, be specific to the population that it's going to be used on, you get these kinds of errors over and over again. Yeah, uh, well, we, 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 we call that a simulation garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> so it's a very interesting concept. And uh, so I don't deal with data which is uh, non-physical. So everything which I do has is based on laws of physics. So. Uh, for me, diversity sort of comes in the way of, so physical situations generally change based on some things. So if you increase something, something different happens. And so if your model hasn't seen that, there's no way it can predict that, right? So I see it from that lens and I completely agree with that. Um, the, the question is uh, how do we incorporate that? Just on a side note, I'm, I can give you an example. I'm very proud to tell you that uh, my sister uh, works at Amazon and uh, she was the sole developer of Echo in the Bay Area when it was under, under development, which is basically an AI system. Um, so th I think they are doing something, but obviously not enough. So uh, uh, this is Sam, let, let me add one more thing here. So in terms of data and diversity of data, uh, I, I will give you an example in additive manufacturing because that's that's what I do. So we we wrote a paper a couple of years ago where we used data from published papers on additive manufacturing process and what the outcome was in terms of defects and material properties. And the idea was to use what's known as a Bayesian network, which is a machine learning network, to predict and give some. Uh, insight for practitioners on how to choose process parameters so that you make you can make good part here. But the problem is when we searched our own papers, there's only 42 papers that actually published this data. And basically it was all in one type of material only or two or three types of material. So for lack of data, 
that's the best we can do in the predictive modeling. It's not that we wanted to be biased intentionally, but that's all out there. So do you want to take the data that's out there and do some modeling and predict it? Or do you want to wait to collect all the data so that you can be perfect here? So it's an incremental process. So in that sense, you're not going to get it right the first time. I think, Sam, you bring up a great um, point because um, access to the data to build your algorithms is equally important. And we know the, the bigger the data, the larger the data, the better your algorithm is going to be. And how do you get it? Um, and some of the, even in the medical you know, field, some of the disease processes, there are just not enough you know, in some of the rare diseases or something, you're not going to get a large amount of data. So I think, you know, there is that fine line. Do you, do you augment that data, you know, with multiple other, you know, tools that we have in the AI world and then get a, you know, prediction towards it. But I think it's very, that's where it comes back to the transparency, whoever is building it or whoever is the AI maker, they're very transparent about how they build that algorithm so that people who are trying to either use it or build on it to improve the models really understand it. And I think it, it is also, it, I mean, it's a tricky thing because commercially, I mean, if I'm going to make a commercial product out of it, I really don't want to tell all, you know, tell it all. So I think, again, it's a, it's a fine line. And I think that, you know, all this, this robust discussion that we are having is because we are literally, we are in it. Like we are building it, we are implementing it, we are using it, we are testing it, and we have no clue what it is going to do or what the future looks like. So I think as humanity, I mean, this is an exciting and a crazy, scary time at the same time. Um, so, so that's why I think it's, these are hard questions. We don't just don't have the answers. Oh, I'm just going to uh, quickly say that during these times of COVID, when we are talking to each other as scientists more often than we otherwise do, I predict that we're going to go and look back on this time and say, this was a time of fruitful scientific discovery because we were able to more easily share data, share opinions. I've gone to more virtual conferences than I could ever have possibly gone to in physical conferences. I just couldn't travel that much to go there. But because of the virtual conferences, I could actually participate in these discourses more often. And I think it's going to lead to a, a, a just a, a rich renaissance of papers in this in this era. Just just as an FYI, I'm in charge of organizing a very large virtual conference next year, so I know the pedals of it. <laughs> 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 no, but to Glenn's point, I think the COVID has definitely kind of, you know, shown to us that open data sharing and open science collaboration is so much possible. I mean, think about it when COVID started, and I don't want to digress into the COVID world because truthfully, at times that's the world I really live in. But um, it, the number of papers that came out, we have COVID, you know, image sharing platforms that we have been talking about open image sharing platforms forever. But in these past six months, we have actually made it happen. So I think, yes, maybe this is the best time for data collaboration and open sharing. And we'll look back and say, this was a really good time and we were part of it. Why did it take COVID to make us do this? <laughs> good point. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to provide a perspective on an answer to that question with another question. So I've got a question from the audience. And unfortunately, we don't have the kind of individual that we would really need to address this. I'm going to ask you to reflect on this within your field. And here's the question. I am curious how the legal field is addressing this issue of who owns the data. It's not just machine data, but also DNA data from genetics testing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, in, in the middle of all this, this sudden moment of optimism we're having about the benefit of, COVID sequestration and what it has forced us to do in terms of reaching out and sharing information with the other, other with each other. What are the legal dimensions of this? And how are we going to reconcile what the what 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 the political dimension of this? Now, not in a political sense, but in terms of the guidelines of our society, which reflects on our legal dimensions of, of this kind of issue. So anybody have any any sense or any thoughts on that? So uh, to my mind, um, we're a bit in the kind of the wild west still of, uh, of, of data law, 
right? Um, we certainly have been behind in thinking about questions like ownership and use. Um, um, behind, what I mean by behind is we're at a point where there's more data out there than there are as laws to tell us how to think about it, right? Um, and in consequence of that, um, I forget what the term is, uh, whether leapfrogging is the right term, but it's, it's a bit like uh, when you're out to war and you know that the truce is coming you know, at the end of the day and what you want to do is you paratroop people just to the farthest perimeter you can to say, oh, well, we got that far, so now that's ours. That's a little bit what's happening with data, right? So companies now just want to put their hands around as much as they could get before you know, the hammer comes down and say, you don't actually own this. Um, so to my mind, there's a the bit of that Wild West mentality, like let, let's just do what we can right now um, because we're behind. Um, and the political situation is such that uh, there's very little will to regulate at the moment, especially these sorts of issues, at least in my experience. Yeah, I think we're seeing a number of court cases that are coming to the surface right now involving the big data companies and how much how much of that they can actually corral and keep and how much they own and how much maybe they should be subdivided so as to control exactly those issues. It's a, it's a very good point. And there, there's a, a set of, sorry, just one thing, there's a set of technical issues in here that go hand in hand with the, uh, with the legal <clears throat> issues in the sense that Google has the infrastructure to hold our data. I don't have the infrastructure to hold my biomedical data, right? Someone could give me a file, but I will do absolutely nothing with it if you give it to me. I don't have the expertise uh, or the power to read it. Um, so uh, th there's, a, uh, uh, there's a technical question of once we figure out who owns the data, can they actually do something with it? Or should we just give it to Google? Because the only ones who can actually use it. Sorry, Whitney. No, you're fine. I was literally going to take it to a different place of, but this is where the distrust comes from because mm -hmm. it isn't regulated. No one knows what's actually happening. And to your point earlier about people are going to do what they were doing with information before, whether it was good and if it wasn't so good, right? It's that those practices are still going to continue. And we have prior knowledge to know that some people don't necessarily do things for the good. And that's scary because it's unregulated. And we know people don't have, aren't always the best people. <laughs> there are bad things that have happened in the past. Yeah, California has at least tried with the California data protection law, uh, which is based on the European uh, general data protection mm -hmm. Uh, statutes. Uh, I think it's a step in the right direction generally. I don't know that it's a perfect law, but but I think more states need to take a look at it unless the nation wants to look at it as a federal issue. Yeah, I agree. The European GDPR laws are much, um, much better and more, you know, more protective of the data. But at this point, I mean, there is really no legal or regulatory guidelines. People are talking about it actively, but um, even when it comes to, you know, the medical data, like we'll get many times requests by companies who want the data, but then the, that data is going to be used for commercial products. And there is nothing wrong with it. But I think the overriding principle of number one, do no harm. And then the number two is if you're going to use that data for the patients, of the patients, they need to know that that data did them good or did some other patients good. There is that you know, again, transparency of what you're going to do with my data. And many times people don't want an ownership, but they want to know that it's being used for societal or environmental good. And so those kind of, you know, overriding principles are very important, but there needs to be guidelines that all of us can actually use. I'm not trying to put say that companies don't know it. We don't know it. When they come to us, we are like, okay, who is the expert over here? And truthfully, no one is. I think the flip situation is, is for example, in um, autonomous vehicles, there probably nobody wants to own the data because then it comes down to who's going to pay insurance. There's also, if we're talking about regulatory efforts, there's parallel open data initiative efforts um, that want to make sure that data used by uh, or collected by private entities or public entities for that matter is both interoperable. So it's not just one use Kind of, I use it with my system, but then to get it into your system, you'll have to do five years of research, both interoperable and just open. Um, and that's happening, you know, toe in toe with regulatory efforts. Yeah. 
Jane, could I uh, could I ask you? So I've seen a couple of questions come in through my chat log, but you had better control over this. Uh, are there questions from the audience that uh, we can direct that uh, are relevant to the conversations we've been having? Yes, um, I just listed one too. Uh, what infrastructure and standards are needed to help expand data sharing? So I think that came off of when we we're talking about COVID and making things, uh, everybody needs to share. What do we need to have in place at the university and broader to be able to share our data? I'll, I'll provide just a, just a momentary perspective and Glenn, you can, you can add to this. So I, I work with the National Institute of Standards and Technologies. And again, in the smart city realm, the issue of standardization of data sets, particularly for standardization where you have city jurisdictions or overlapping jurisdictions and how those jurisdictions manage the data that makes their cities efficient or not, uh, in any case, is a question that comes up all the time. It's a question at this stage. I'm sure that there are lots of work, there is a lot of work being done to try to resolve some of this. But I think much like some of the conversations we've been listening to here over the last hour and a half or so, a lot of these questions are still formative and we're not quite certain whether we're asking the question in the right way or not. Like Glenn, can you add anything to that based on your work? Indeed, so uh, one of the things about cities is that they have these arbitrary geographic boundaries and the things they want to measure and understand tend not to end at their geographic boundaries. So really we have to have regions that work together to be able to understand what's happening in their region and then the differences within the region. And uh, since different uh, municipalities, as you pointed out, Michael, measure things in different ways, have different levels of resilience built in, and you should comment on that, even though you're the moderator, you should talk about the resilience of the city before we give up here, that those are the things that need to be taken in ways that are comparable. Yeah, thank you, Glenn. Um, I'll make just a, just a brief comment on that issue. So as, as, as I mentioned, and as Glenn knows, most of my work has been in the field of, of, of resiliency in cities. And this goes from the personal level all the way up to the institutional. And we're seeing right now, I think that this COVID situation from my perspective has been a, 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 a litmus test. Well, I, I, let me put it this way. In, in 2001, 9-11, we came to recognize that our national security infrastructure for the nation was inadequate to the threat that was facing us. And as a consequence, we built an entire department, the Department of Homeland Security to address that threat. So now we are all living in the post 9-11 world and we know what the implications of that have been, meant to us. And we see them every time we used to try to get on an airplane. Now we don't try to get on airplanes anymore, <laughs> but. When you, when you went to an airport, you saw the impact, literally bad choice of words, you saw the outcomes from a failure of our way of thinking about national security. Then came Hurricane Katrina. And so Hurricane Katrina demonstrated to us, and particularly to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, that the structures that we had built nationwide for emergency management were inadequate to the scale or the scope of the problem that could just strike one city in one region. So now look at 2020, and, and now we're living in the post-Katrina world and the emergency management community from local level all the way up to the federal agencies have made enormous strides and enormous changes in addressing that, recognizing that we are now living in the post-Katrina world. So we're now in the post-9-11 world, we're in the post-Katrina world. We are not yet in the post-COVID world. But I can guarantee you that we are going to be getting there eventually. And what we will recognize is that our public health system has been shown to be inadequate for the scale of the threat that can affect our entire society. So thinking as a risk manager does, we want to look ahead beyond COVID-19. We want to solve this problem and strengthen our ability to use data wisely in understanding the biological and public health threats that our nation faces. So the question you wanna ask yourself is what's the next thing? Eventually we're gonna be in the post-COVID, we'll be in the post-9-11, post-Katrina, post-COVID world. 
where do we, what should we be anticipating or attempting to anticipate after that? It may be wildland fires. As the West Coast has shown us, there's a scale that is happening now that we've never seen before. And some predicting models are showing it could get, it, it probably will likely get, be getting worse. This may be the point at which we begin to transition over to, to understanding climatic change on the scale of whole, whole planetary climates, much as the meteorologists are beginning to do for like high altitude prediction and those kind of things. But you can see where this is leading us. So the more we gain capability, the more we recognize that there are things we need to use our capability to get at to protect our society in general. So that's my two cents on the resilience field, uh, uh, Gwen. So thank you for asking that question. Thanks. Um, hey, hey, Michael, this is Sam here. Um, since the question is about data sharing, I, I just want to throw out one more additional uh, facet to that. Uh, we work on a lot of projects that include uh, export control, US export control, and ITAR data. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, concern in, in how this data is you know, protected uh, and making sure that uh, it doesn't get into the wrong hands and so on. That has increased dramatically in the past three or four years on how we go about uh, you know, protecting the data in the university, particularly for these kinds of research contracts. Of course, there's a separate export control office. So it, it, is, it is something that we need to be cognizant of that uh, there are outside forces trying to gain this data and how we should protect it and so on. I, I don't want this to be a political discussion, but that's, that's uh, in terms of data sharing, uh, that kind of threat has increased dramatically and we should, we should be cognizant of it and people should understand that uh, that kind of data is, is important from a national perspective, a national security perspective, and uh, we need to be careful. Thank you, Sam, appreciate that. And great point on the, on the how we get cognizant of what our limitations are. That's a, that's a tough problem. Um, folks, uh, any, other, any other comments for where we are right now? Or Jane, can I ask you, is there, is there, are there any other questions or another question that we can maybe close our session out with? We're getting, uh, getting fairly well along in time and we've had a great conversation. Yep, um, I think we don't have any more questions, but we would like to show the final results of the word cloud. Mm -hmm. And then just kind of if everybody can kind of give on the panel, give a little bit of an input or, you know, just your impression on it. And there, the second one, we added transparency, computing, ethics, security, um, even though we didn't talk about it much uh, and we brought it up in the end, but obviously that's a big, big item for people. So. Anybody? Oh, and this is the combined. So this was the final uh, with everything, every, everybody's input from the whole time. So that's, uh, that's really great. I think you've just programmed the sixth uh, data day. <laughs> I the official topics. <laughs> I think you're right. And that's, that's one of the things that we, uh, we plan to keep the conversation going and we may have something uh, even before, although it's the, Data Day 6 is in April, I believe. Uh, we're going to have it next April when that's typically when we do have it. So this one we pushed out to um, October because of all the stuff. But um, so it'll be sooner than later before we know it. Hopefully we can all be in person, but we won't hold our breaths for that. Well, let me just um, let, let me just offer a final word i think uh, one of the things that i've i've learned right away and, and we're going to see this in a second is we're going to need to have a uh, a key on our keypads for electronic clapping uh, <laughs> so we can provide applause at the end of these sessions i want to thank the members of this panel yeah something something like that that's, that's pretty good um, i want to thank the members of this panel this has been a really fascinating discussion with a real diverse perspective on a, a whole range of diverse problems as well, but also centrally focusing on our data management and where we go. I wanna uh, offer obvious thanks to Glenn Riker and Glenn, your participation in this and your, uh, and your address to us earlier on to set the stage for this conversation. And then finally, I wanna circle back around again to thank uh, Dr. Shima Wang and, and his staff for having hosted this in the first place. And with that, I'm going to declare our panel uh, adjourned, and I'm going to turn it over to Jane for the uh, for the final uh, conversation or the final closeout. 
Well, thank you, uh, Michael. And yes, we thank everybody that's been involved. I would like to, I'm going to give everybody a heads up. Uh, if everybody could turn on their um, video now and we can all see each other uh, when we're ending here. I don't really have anything else to say except for check out uh, upcoming training and sessions that uh, through our data and computational science series. Uh, here's the um, planning committee again. And thank you again to our panelists and uh, session moderator, Michael and keynote Glenn. And of course, thanks to the UC Office of the Provost for the Universal Provider Grant uh, that helps support this and to IT at UC and UC Libraries. So if everybody could turn on their video, let's all, and we can all do the uh, American Sign Language um, clapping for everybody. Let's see if that works. You might have to go to gallery view. There we go. Look, people are doing it. <laughs> Yay! Come on, I don't see everybody. Turn on your videos. <laughs> Can somebody take a picture of this or something? Good clapping. <laughs> yeah, this is better than uh, than than the videos or the uh, Zoom video we've seen recently in the news. So this will make a good one. <laughs> I just had to bring that up. All right, have a great weekend, everybody. We're probably going to be down at. Uh, Arnold's, Ar Arlen's on Short Vine if anybody wants to join us. Arlen's. Bye. See y'all soon.